0.75, and then the minimum of, uh, just writing it, uh, 0.6, uh, F ultimate A and T plus Fy, UBS is 1, so that's why Fy is going to be Fy A, that's A and B, so A and T, and then 0.6 Fy A, B, B plus Fy A and B. So that's, that's the equation we're using. This is the equation we're using. <coughs> so we need to look closely about what's going on. We said that this failure, the first one, so that, that's the shear, this one here, that's the shear fracture case. And then this one here is the shear yielding case. So we need to look at the parameters, how to find them. That's, that's the hard part now. I mean, writing the equation is easy, but doing the parameters is the hard part. So the first thing I look at is, uh, let's find, I want to find here A and B. I want to find A, G, B, and I want to find A and T. I already know that F ultimate, F, Y is equal to, uh, that's A36 T, so that's 36 PSI. We got that from table 2-4, and that's 58 PSI. So we know these two, right? We got these already. Uh, So uh, let's start first by AGB. AGB is the area, and here it's gross area under shear. So let's see what's happening here in AGB. We said that that happens when you have shear yielding. So shear yielding, you're not going to have complete fracture due to shear. So what's going on here is that all this area is going to yield like this. This whole area will yield. You'll have yielding, and the yielding goes around the holes like this. This would, this would fracture, but this would yield. So AGB is going to be that distance, the distance from here to here. We call that LB. That's the length for shear. So all this distance, this area, all of it is going to be under shear yielding in shear, so that will make AGB is equal to LB, and then you have to multiply that by the thickness, right? So that's going to be multiplied by the thickness, by the thickness of the plate. So LB in this case is going to be the entire length. It's going to be this entire length here under shear, and we don't deduct from it the area of the holes because the yielding happens around the holes. So the whole length is under here, this yielding. So it's 3 plus 3 plus 1 and a half, so it's 7.5. So LB is equal to, uh, so it's equal to 7.5 inches. So AGB here is equal to 7.5 inches, and then multiplied by the thickness, the thickness here. That's the thickness of the angle. So this angle, uh, the angle looks like this, right? The, the thickness here, the thickness is equal to quarter inch, right? Because it's a four by four by quarter. So we discussed four, meaning that one leg is four, the other leg is four inches as well, and then the thickness is uh, quarter inch. So that's multiplied by a quarter. <coughs> that's the easy part to get this AGB uh, 1.875. That's square inches. So here I don't deduct area of the holes because it's uh, yielding. The second part is A and B. So that's the net. And this is the net area under shear. So this is related to fracture. So when fracture happens, the holes don't count. 
here the hole will not count and uh, the fracture surface looks like this and then you have the a hole and then you have another hole and then you have like a quarter hole here and that's how the block that's the block that's going to rupture right and then that distance here that's the center that distance here is equal to uh, this distance is equal to LV, right? That's what we discussed. So here we got rupture. So I'm looking at NV, and NV here is going to be only these surfaces. So it's going to be the ones in red because it's fractured. So there's no yield in here. So you need to get the net area. So for this specific problem. I'm going to deduct, there's one hole diameter here, right, that's VH. And then there's another hole diameter here I need to deduct. And then here there's a half hole diameter I need to deduct as well. Right. So and for this problem, I'll have uh, L A and B is going to be equal to LB minus 2.5, right, 2.5 pH, multiplied by the thickness. For this specific problem, right? So the point is, this can change based on your problem. This number is because I give you like, a, you know, like I see that here too. So like, for example, the homework problem, the block shear rupture here is gonna, can be different, right? Depends on the problem. Here it's not different because there are three. But, but here, for example, you're going to have A and T, it's going to be, A and B is going to be multiplied by T because you have two surfaces. So this equation you have to derive and it's different based on what problem you use. So this is not, this equation I'm writing here is not a general equation. So that's, this is a specific for this problem. So you have to derive the equation for each problem by yourself, figuring out where the fracture will take place. So there's no equation I can write for you that works for every case. Right, for, for example, here, see this, uh, this one's can be completely different equations. So you have to derive it. Uh, How do you get the two points off? Yeah, so I'm looking at net area, right? Uh, I'm looking at the net area. So we call that distance LB, right? From here, from the end to the centroid of the first hole. That's LB. And we're looking at net area after fracture. So it's going to fracture here. So I'm deducting the holes I have. I have one hole, another hole, and then half a hole. It's not full. So you know, one, one and half makes 2.5. So this is just specific for this problem, so you, you have to drive it for each problem. So that's why I don't post, I don't post these uh, on, I used to post them in EcoSphere and then I, every problem has uh, block shear rupture. I see everyone using 2.5, it's the same equation, right? So that's why I don't write, I don't want to post it uh, online because it's not a general equation. You have to figure it out for each uh, problem set. So um, just to plug in the numbers here, um, so go get, go find A and B. So that's going to be equal to uh, 7.5, right? That's the LV minus 2.5. The diameter of the hole is one inch. And then multiply that by the thickness. That will be equal to 1.25 kilograms. That's the shear uh, A and B. The 
worst thing to get is AMP, that's the net area under tension. So we got, you know, this will crack like this if the, if there's a problem, that's how it looks like. And then that's the center, and then this will crack here. So we call that AMP, the one in the AMP is the shear one, that's AMP is the tension one. So it's always net. So that's AMP. So that distance is given in the problem, right? That's from the centroid. It's given one and a half inches from the center of the bolt. That's one and a half inches. And then we deduct here. We have to deduct here, that's half the bolt band, half the whole band, uh, that's half. So it's going to be the one and a half inches, so A and T is equal to the 1.5 minus the half, which is one inch, the bolt diameter, right, that's bolt diameter, divided by two, multiplied by the thickness, so that's equal to, uh, And equal to 0 0.25 square inches. <coughs> Again, all these equations uh, are not uh, are not generative equations. Okay, I had to drive them. Each problem will, will have a different equation. Not different numbers, different equations. So that's why the code didn't give you an equation for these because you have to come up with I got the numbers, I just need to plug it in. So uh, I got here PT, T sub N. Uh, is equal to 0 0.75 multiplied by the minimum of one of these two, right? That's going to be 0 0.6 FY AGD plus uh, F ultimate AMP. And here is going to be 0 0.6 F of. Sorry, that's. Yeah, F ultimate A and T and E doesn't make a difference for the A and T. Right. So that's equal to 0 0.75, and then I need to put the numbers. So I uh, actually I should have switched these because it should stop the fracture first, but it's not a big deal. Anyway, that's 0 0.6. F ultimate is 36. AGB is uh, 1.875. And then plus 0 point, yeah, plus 58 multiplied by 0 0.25, right? That's the first one. That's the first one. Second one is 0 0.6. 58 A and B is uh, 1.25 plus 58 multiplied by 0.25. So I find out this number, which is shear yielding, would be equal to uh, 40.5. And then this number here, which is shear fracture, would be equal to 43.5. That skips. So it's obvious that the shear fracture is the one shear yielding would govern. So this one governs. Right? Because that number is the same for both. So shear yielding governs. So that's 0 0.75 multiplied by 40.5 plus 58 multiplied by quarter. So that's uh, that's going to be equal to 41.3 hertz. That's PT T sub.
you guys saw here the uh, PT, T sub N for yielding and fractures were higher. That means that block shear rupture governs. So this one governs. So if I'm working on a problem, then T ultimate should not exceed 41.3 kips for this problem. Can't exceed that amount. That's based on uh, that's based on uh, so based on shear uh, yielding uh, fracture and block shear rupture just like block shear rupture governs so that's what governs the design um, so here in these problems block shear rupture will be different right here block shear rupture you can have two surfaces here one here you can find A and B here is going to be different A and B here will be different because you have two surfaces. This one will be completely different. We talked about that last time. And the force here is vertical and it goes to horizontal. So let's look at the last failure mode. Uh, unless there are any questions about what you got? So let's look at bearing and tear out. So we, we've mentioned that before. It says when sometimes none of these happen. And what happens is bearing and tear out. And bearing happen <coughs> when you have uh, when you have contact. Bearing stresses happen when two surfaces are in contact. You guys uh, were asking about soil mechanics, right? Uh, you guys know bearing stresses, right? They, they, they call them bearing stresses because there are two surfaces in contact, right? The concrete uh, pudding in contact with the soil, pushing down it. That's the same as uh, soil, same stresses like soil, but here they're steel on steel. You got the bolt here, and then you got the hole, and this thing wants to move to the right. This wants to move to the right. And uh, this wants to stay in place. So it puts very high bearing stresses contact this thing. You sometimes you can hear it actually if there is wind and stuff, you can hear it. That starts to do pounding, you know. Uh, um, so it's in contact and then you keep putting force on it, it can uh, tear, I mean it can just distort the plate here you can cause, on, especially if the plate is uh, thin, then it starts to distort it. So it produces uh, a lot of stresses, and then you start seeing the plate being distorted like this. Um, so that's bearing. If you're there's something called a clear land. That clear land, if it's too small, then uh, you can tear out the whole thing. So bearing starts, it starts with bearing, but then ends up with tear out. Especially if the bolt uh, doesn't have a large uh, clear length. So like, let me let me ask you this question. I mean, if you have a if you have a plate like this, it's not a good idea to put the bolt right here when you leave a small space, right? There's a problem. Even in wood, I mean, you don't want. Usually, we keep it keep some clear distance here to avoid this type of failure. So if this gets too close, you can just tear it out. So it depends on the clear length. That's for tear out. But for bearing, you can have uh, a good clear length, but you still have bearing issues with uh, distor distortion in the air, in the plate. So you can see here is a block, you can tear out. 
thoughts would be, but it ends up with Tera. Tera is more of uh, edge, edge distance of medium to flat. Or if the bolts are too close to one another, it doesn't have to be the last one, the edge bolt. It can be an interior bolt. If they're too close to one another, then they will still tear out. So here it shows the tear out, it's initiated tear out. Here it's also tear out. Here it's staying. And you can see these used to be, that's the mesh. So that line used to be vertical. You see how much it's closer. Oh, it's not vertical anymore. So let's look at the equations. Uh, let's Look at the manual. As we discussed, that's covered in J10. So it's covered in J310. It's there in the tail. You can see P is always 0 0.75 as well because that's a bit of failure. It's always 0 0.75. We only used 0 0.9 when it was ducted, when it was uh, yielding. So you see, we do a lot of reduction. Um, and here are the equations we use. So we have bearing and then we have tear out uh, equations. Um, so really we, uh, we don't really, uh, Pay attention to, uh, it tells you the type of bolt we're using. So sometimes we use uh, something called slotted bolts. But uh, majority of the cases we use uh, standard. See it's called the uh, talks for standard oversized and short slotted bolts. different types of holes, but in, they are not too common. The most common ones is the standard hole. So that's the bolt is here, and that's where the diameter of the hole is equal to the diameter of the bolt plus one eighth of an inch. That's called the, uh, that's a standard. We have other types of bolts. Uh, there is something called, there is oversized, something called oversized bolts. And then there is long slotted. And there is something called short slotted. So we don't want to care too much about that because that's a completely different thing. So. But I mean, I just want to let you know, sometimes do oversized holes, uh, that's specifically if we're dealing with a, with a contractor, if it's too hard, like uh, too hard to put, uh, you can't have a good tolerance, so you oversize the hole to make it larger. Because these members, it's hard to install them, you're dealing with a contractor that not, doesn't have the right equipment or don't know what they're doing. So for, uh, Sometimes we also use uh, long slotted holes. Um, 
that's also for tolerance reasons. So you can have like a membrane like that, and then we do a long slotted bolt like this, and then the bolt comes and sits here. Sometimes you use things like that. But just forget about that if you want to look at standard bolts. So standard bolt, we're looking at these two equations. Uh, we're looking at bailing and tear out, and then part B is for long slotted holes with the slot perpendicular to the direction of the force, you get a different equation. Uh, so we're looking at these ones, you know, the standard payment. So there are two situations here. One situation is when, when the formation and the surface load it is a design consideration. So sometimes we say under service loads, in some cases we say <coughs> under service loads, we are okay to have some distortions under service loads, that's not ultimate. So you guys have seen the difference between ultimate and service, right? There is a, uh, service load is way, way much smaller. So sometimes we say under service load, we're okay to get some of this in some cases. But, uh, you know, we get some distortions, but it's not too bad as you can see. Just some, a little bit of distortions. So if it's not a, a, an issue, which is the case actually in most buildings, in buildings we really don't care about uh, having some deformations. All, most of our connections have these deformations in buildings. So we don't really care too much about some deformations as long as they're controlled. So we use this value, 2.4. Uh, so most of our cases, we have the uh, service load is not, uh, is not a design consideration. But sometimes it's, it's the case that service load, we say no, at service load, we don't want any deformation to happen. That's more common. That's more common when you have like a crane, because you have a crane and you have a moving load, the crane is sideways. Imagine, uh, so when, when the load is, uh, is continuous, like let's imagine you have a load that's continuous like this. This load, let's say 100 kips. You have 100 kips going on all the time. You get some deformation here and then it stays there forever and then no problem. The problem happens when it's a cyclic load, when it's, uh, when this load, you have this load is equal to 100, the next minute it goes to compression. So you distorted this when it was 100, now it goes to compression, so you distorted the other side, right, it's flipping. And then it keeps going back and forth, a dynamic load, back and forth. Then you crack, it causes something called fatigue issues, you start to have a lot of vibrations and movements because the connection gets more loose. Uh, so that becomes a problem. This type of loads like cyclic, cyclic loads can come from actually, can come from wind. Right, wind loads are cyclic. They can change direction and value. But you have a storm today, maybe 60 miles per hour. Later on you get 100, strong wind get a tornado 160 and then you get 40 and then the wind direction changes uh, it comes from the uh, west this time and now it comes from the south and then it comes from the east you know, depends on how the weather is coming so, so when you have wind loading it becomes an issue we don't like uh, to have uh, distortions at service loads because imagine it gets loose and then the building starts to shake with wind and then you start he hearing this pounding, you know, between the between the bolt because you got distortion, you distorted this. So you start hearing, you know, the thing is loose, going back and forth, and then after many years, it just snaps, you know, crack. So uh, wind is an issue. Uh, earthquake, but earthquake, that's like if you're in California, you feel earthquakes all the time not here, and yeah, also vibration issues. So if you have vibration, can come from crane, 
can come from equipment. You know, like a compressor, you put a compressor in a building on the floor, uh, every time you turn it on, it shakes, you know, when it starts. Because it does that shit. So you have equipment, uh, sometimes in fa industrial, industrial uh, factory, you know, you have a conveyor, you know, from steel construction, if something is moving, then it's uh, dynamic, it's cyclic. Cyclic load changes. So whenever you have this type of cyclic load, as long as it's a uh, cyclic load, then we have to consider service, s serviceability. But if it's if it's not cyclic, like for example, you got uh, a big chandelier, you know, you got that's the ceiling, let's say ceiling. You got the ceiling, you got the chandelier, you're uh, carrying something, it's hanging like that, has a weight W, so the force is always here, W doesn't change. It's never going to change. Inside the building, you have a big chandelier hanging. So you want to design the connection. Uh, heavy, you know, some of these actually are so heavy, especially in churches. You can get these you get, uh, fancy churches. They do heavy chandeliers. Um, so uh, you got a connection here that has a load, doesn't change for time. After you come back 20 years later, it's the same force. Right? It doesn't change. So it's not too common, right? It's not too common to find something like static like that, you know, it doesn't change. So we usually use, so when it's a surface load is a design consideration. So we don't want distortions under surface loads because it's usually a load that is alternating. And also, by the way, li live load as well is, uh, live load could be, not all the time, like furniture is not, right? No. Live load could be, like we come here to a classroom, we pack the classroom, so much load, we leave, zero load, no live load. And then we come back and you know, so on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the thing. So we, if it's a design consideration, so if I don't tell you, then you're gonna assume it's a design consideration, surface load. But if, like it, in very specific cases, it's not, then you can use a higher value, which is okay. So you need to know, you, you make that decision as an engineer, you know, but uh, you need to understand that you don't want to have a cyclic load, load that changes over time, and have that uh, distortion in a service load condition. So as I said, like you got the chandelier here, you install the chandelier, it's gonna deform, and then nothing else is gonna happen. You're gonna have some deformation and then there's no more movement. The force stays as it is forever, until the building is gone. You know? So that's not a problem, but then you, you remove, the load keeps alternating, changing direction, and then that becomes a problem. So we use uh, RN, it's here, see, here it's not TN, we're using RN, because that's per volt. This is actually per volt. So Rn per volt, depending on how many volts you have, is equal to 2.4, the diameter of the volt, multiplied by the thickness, and then multiplied by the F ultimate. So put in mind here uh, two things. Uh, so for bearing, let me write this equation down so we can introduce the parameters. So you have one volt, it's per volt, right? You have one volt here, one hole, and then the volt is actually the size, right? It's, uh, it's so as you guys know, uh, diameter of the volt is less than the diameter of the hole, right? So the volt is gonna push in that direction because it's pushing, it's pulling here, so it pushes in that direction. So you get bearing stresses here. That's similar to the soil being stresses because it's on two contact surfaces. So when that happens, uh, see that Rn, how much force you can put on this? Call it R sub n is equal to 2.4. This 2.4 is an empirical value from the, the experimental, applied by the diameter of the bolt. 
multiplied by the thickness of the plate multiplied by F output of the machine. So put in mind I used here the whole diameter. I did not use the whole diameter, which is larger because the contact surface is going to be equal to the diameter of the hole, not the hole. It's going to be the smaller, right? So can I have a hole? A hole? You can have a hole too big like this, so let me exaggerate, and then your bolt is that small, the bearing stresses will, will be depending on the diameter of the bolt, right? That's, that's too exaggerated, right? It doesn't happen like that, but I'm just showing you. Like, so it's always the bolt diameter, not the whole diameter. So that serviceability is considered, like you don't want the distortion to happen while the bending is in use. Just want the distortion to happen when the, in an extreme event in, at output, not at uh, surface. So that's bearing. So if we exceed that amount, if you exceed that amount, you can have bearing stresses issues. This is going to buckle here, and all that stuff is going to happen. You know? So that's a bearing issue. Tear out is different. Tear out, as we said, uh, it depends on. It all depends on the L sub C. It depends on that distance here. All that L sub C. So when uh, it, it really, it's not uh, an issue of bailing now. A bailing will happen, but then it's going to be followed by tear out. So the L sub C, imagine if L sub C is too small, you're going to tear it out right away. So uh, L sub C is equal to, so Rn is going to be equal to 1.2 for tear out, 1.2 L sub C T F output. So the 1.2 comes from experimental testing. That subserviceability is uh, considered. You don't want deformation and service loads. But if you're okay with deformation and service loads, you can use 1.5 higher value. So Rn is equal to 1.2. Uh, you can see here it doesn't even matter what the whole diameter is. L sub C T F of it. That's very good tear out. So L sub C is the clear distance, T is the thickness, and ultimate is the output stress. stress. like five minutes just to think about it until I find where it's at. Uh.